Well, hello and welcome everybody. This is your host, Ken D. Foster. Today, we are going to talk a little bit about wellness in the workplace. Wellness, well-being. What does that really mean to you, by the way? I was thinking about that myself. You know, and it's not just a word. It's something that we actually realize in our lives. And wellness is all about mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual wellness in our lives, in our personal lives, and of course, in our workplace. It's interesting. Sometimes people try to compartmentalize, it's a big word, <laughs> compartmentalize their, their life, right? So at home, you're feeling, you know, you're, you're doing great. You're doing well, you know, it, you're, you're happy, you're healthy, you're out, you know, doing your thing. But you go to the workplace, and now there's different stressors there, and all of a sudden, it's almost somebody else shows up. You ever experienced that for yourself or maybe for others in your workplace? Well, today we have a workplace wellness expert. She's been working in uh, companies, uh, actually over a couple hundred companies, uh, really bringing the principles of well-being into the workplace. So if this is something that you want to explore and take a deeper dive in, Stay tuned. We got a whole bunch around this uh, in today's episode. All right, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back with my special guest. Are you over 50? Would you like to get up to 33% more income in retirement? Then call now for this free book, Annuity Do's and Don'ts for Baby Boomers. This free book reveals little-known secrets about annuity strategies that will help you make the right choices before buying an annuity. Call right now for your free book. And as a bonus, we'll also throw in a free annuity rate report, both absolutely free, for calling Annuity General today. Call 800-510-0470. Everybody wants cheap airfare, but where do you find it? You call low-cost airlines. They specialize in cheap flights, discount hotel rooms, cheap car rental rates, and with the best price guarantee. If you want the lowest prices on your airline tickets or other travel services, call now. That's right, call. That's the only way to get these rates. Experts are standing by 24-7 to get you the cheapest airfare and hotel rates available. So don't wait. Call now. If you're living with diabetes and using insulin, you know the pain of pricking your fingers over and over again. By wearing a small remote device called a Continuous Glucose Monitor, or CGM, you can reduce the pain of pricking your fingers right away. If you're testing your blood sugar four more times per day, injecting insulin three or more times per day, or using an insulin pump, call the Diabetic Health Hotline today and learn about the latest CGM technology. Not only can a CGM immediately reduce pain, it's accurate, easy to use, and helps you make better diabetes treatment decisions. And if you have Medicare, you can get a new CGM at little or no out-of-pocket cost. We'll also provide free shipping of your new CGM and we'll bill your insurance company for you. If you are testing your blood sugar four more times per day and injecting insulin three or more times per day or using an insulin pump, call now and learn how to receive your new continuous glucose monitor at little or no out-of-pocket cost. Hi, JJ is back because this is important. Do you know if your Medicare Advantage plan benefits are changing this year? Are your costs and co-pays going up? Is your doctor still covered? During the annual enrollment period, you can call to find out all the changes to your coverage. Plus, see if you're eligible for a plan with the benefit that adds money back to your Social Security check every month. AEP has a deadline, so don't delay. Call now. I called to find a plan with lower co-pays and more dental coverage. I called to see if my zip code has a plan with the benefit that adds money back to my Social Security check. I called to make sure my doctors are still in my plan. Extra benefits, extra money. Dino mine. AEP has a deadline, so don't delay. Call now. Call 1-800-957-1821. That's 1-800-957-1821 now. Has social-emotional learning become just one more thing on your teacher's plates? Do teachers and students both find it boring and ineffective? Then bring Kikori to your school. Kikori transforms classrooms through experiential SEL activities that help students play, reflect, connect, and grow. Even better, students say it's more fun than recess. 
Schedule a no obligation conversation at kikoriapp.com slash bring Kikori. K-I-K-O-R-I. Well, welcome back, everybody, uh, to the Voices of Courage show. Today, we're going to call this show the courage to uh, be, uh, what am I calling it? The courage to better well-being. Oh, boy, it's I'm having a time talking today, I guess, here, Laura. Laura, welcome to the show. <laughs> it's so good to have you. It's, it's great to have you with us today. Can, Thanks uh, for having me, Laura, Ken. It's great to be here. Okay, good, good. So for those of you that don't know Laura, Laura Putnam is a leading voice for well-being at work. She's an international public speaker and an author of Workplace Well-Being That Works as a CEO of Motion Infusion and the creator of leadership training, Managers on the Move. She infuses well-being, vitality, I think that's the key, into the workplace to help employees, teams, and organizations thrive. That's quite a, quite a bit that you're doing in the workplace today. Boy, do we ever need that. I'm thinking right now uh, what's going on with the, quote, great, uh, uh, the, uh, great uh, resignation, you know, where you've got 50,000 people that have left their jobs here in the last uh, couple of years. You've got one in five thinking about leaving now. Um, a lot of this has to do with uh, well-being, I'm thinking. Is that, is that accurate, Laura? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, one thing that's really come out of the pandemic is people stopping to think about what matters most. And one of the things that people are really realizing is their overall health and well-being. People are no longer willing to sacrifice that. And so they are effectively voting with their feet, as we have seen with the Great Resignation, where we had as many as four million people a month who are leaving their position. And now more recent, more recently, we're seeing a trend of quiet quitting where people are staying, but they're really drawing strict boundaries between uh, their work and their lives outside of work, um, making sure that they have time to invest in their well-being. Hmm. You know, what comes to my mind is, uh, yeah, I've talked to so many people over the years where they were, you know, very prideful about having, you know, 30, 60, 90 uh, days of sick time built up, right? And I'm, I'm just wondering what those numbers are today as people become more conscious and aware that the health is uh, is number one priority in, for a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, we have long-standing cultural norms around overwork, <laughs> around uh, uh, ignoring our self-care. But I think that um, again, out of this pandemic, we've really had uh, had an opportunity to reflect on what matters most. And mm-hmm. at the end of the day, what matters most is that we really pr- protect the sanctity of ourselves as human beings, not just as work beings, but as human beings. Mm. Yeah, it makes so much sense. You know, you wrote the book, uh, Workplace Wellness That Works. Uh, what works? What, what kind of wellness works in the workplace? Well, first, I want to start with actually talking about how workplace wellness efforts, unfortunately, don't work (laughs) a lot of times. (laughs) (laughs) And and, and actually, I wrote this as a nod to a lot of the the research that was coming out, a lot of uh, mainstream articles uh, around how workplace wellness does not work, um, as in, you know, the largest study to date on the impact of workplace wellness found that up to 80% of eligible employees are simply opting out of their wellness programs and that their company offers. And so what we've learned the hard way is that unlike the field of dreams, if you build it as in a workplace wellness program, people will not necessarily come. And so the, the real question becomes, how do we build programs that actually help people to not only engage with these programs, but also reap the benefits from them so, so that they actually become healthier and happier as a result of that. And, and again, the results on a lot of these well-intended wellness programs have at best been mixed. And so in this book, I, I really provide some better ways to leverage every workplace to promote better health and well-being and happy to walk you through that. 
Well, you know, and, and uh, our society today, I think the latest statistic that I saw, there's somewhere around sixty uh, percent of the people now, uh, in certain cities, are obese. So, and that's a direct reflection of what's going on, I think, in the workplace. So, uh, these, I'm surprised that the wellness programs that they put in place don't work. Uh, can you give me uh, uh, some examples of maybe what does work? Yeah, you know, I mean, one of the key factors it, it seems to be around, ironically, focusing less on the individual and more on the environment and the culture that surrounds the individual. So while we often hear the expression that we as human beings, we are, quote, creatures of habit, and so there's been a lot of discussion around better habit formation. How do we help motivate the individual? How do we arm them with better strategies around forming individual habits? The research actually suggests that it the, the, the primary driver of either poor health and well-being, as we're seeing with rising rates of obesity, for example, or good well-being, healthy well-being, um, has to do more with the environment than with our personal choices. And um, all of us tend to adapt very quickly to the environment and the culture that surrounds us. And so again, if we look at, at something like obese, rise in obesity rates, researchers, scientists have uncovered what they characterize as so-called obesogenic environments, where the environment itself, itself whether we're talking about these, uh, you know, neighborhoods that are better designed for our cars than they are for us getting physically active, or the fact that we've got cultural norms around sitting, we're sitting about 10 hours a day, um, or we've got, we're surrounded by fast food um, courts. And, um, you know, so the unhealthy choice is actually the easy choice. Every organization can be thinking about creating an oasis of well-being to serve as a counterpoint to these in, these environments of poor health so that Every employee, when they come to their, when they come to work, whether it's in person or virtual, they are nudged toward better health and well-being. So this is something that a lot of companies have been thinking about for a long time. Like Google, for example, has been thinking a lot about how do we engineer an, an environment and a, and a culture in which people are just kind of naturally healthy when they come to work. Wow, that that brings up a lot of questions. I, you know. <clears throat> There's been a lot of research in the past that uh, your uh, environment, your will, your uh, environment is stronger than your willpower. So and you know, just go in your, you know, make, make a commitment not to eat any sugar and then have sugar in your closet at home and see how strong you are. Right. That you, exactly. you can see immediately that is not happening. Right. So I, I really like uh, where we're going. You know, I was as you were saying that to me, I was thinking, you know, we're we're. Uh, you know, we may be creatures of habit, but I think we're stronger creatures of, uh, what do I want to say, oneness or collaboration or connection. When we can connect with one another and feel that bond, um, it seems like, you know, for me, when I work out, I work out all the time when I have a commitment to with a workout buddy. But if I'm doing it on my own, eh, you know, the weather might not be right. I might not do it. Right. So I, I just think there's a piece there where we can design that so we can collaborate with one another. Seems like it makes sense. Is that yeah. what they're finding? Oh, totally. And, and you know, it's really interesting. What are those things that that really help us to stay on track with these well-intended goals and New Year's resolutions that we set? And um, we've got New Year's coming up right around the corner. Um, we know that uh, on average, eighty-eight percent of those New Year's resolutions that we set for ourselves they fail. Uh, so, how can we set ourselves up for success? One is just as you spoke about to to think about doing it in partnership with someone else. We're much more likely to succeed on our New Year's resolutions or on our goals around our health and well-being if we're doing it with somebody else. We as human beings, we are hardwired to connect. But also thinking about, um, you know, instead of prioritizing our health, for example, I'm going to exercise so that I can lose weight, for example. If we instead exercise for something that's more immediate, like energy, then we're actually more likely to continue doing it. There was an interesting study that came out of University of Michigan 
where they found that those women, uh, it was lo actually looking at a group of women um, around exercise, and they found that those women who were exercising for energy were much more likely to continue doing it than those women who were exercising hmm. to lose weight. Hmm. Boy, that's really interesting. I never even thought about that. But in my own life, I uh, I work out, I eat healthy, I you know, I meditate, I take care of myself mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually. I do it because I my parents, as they aged, they were all in my you know my grandparents and parents and a lot of family members. They were they were in pain, and I said to myself, I'm gonna I'm gonna be pain free when I get to those ages. So I'm not exercising to lose weight or to you know it's, it's that it's that uh, pain free uh, motivation, and it's working. You know, it's working great. So interesting you mentioned that. I'd never thought about that before. Listen, yeah, I, I, mean, I, think, I think all of us have to find clever ways to outsmart our uh, change resistant brains. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that so whatever true? works? <laughs> all right, listen, I got to take a, a break. And uh, when we come back, though, you just kind of touched on what I'd like to touch on. And that is maybe some of the, uh, the ways we could shift our brain, additional ways. And what are the attitudes that we might need to, to start to instill in ourselves to be able to really break through those uh, stop-start patterns like we discussed in the New Year's resolutions? We'll be right back. Attention cancer victims who used the weed killer Roundup. A federal jury unanimously found that Monsanto's popular weed killer Roundup was a substantial factor in causing cancer. You may be entitled to substantial compensation. If you or someone you love used Roundup and were diagnosed with cancer, call the number on your screen now. Don't wait, there may be time deadlines to file a claim. Call 800-506-2151. That's 800-506-2151. Do you listen to the TV on high volume or have trouble hearing conversations? Then you would benefit from hearing aids. Don't waste thousands on expensive hearing aids when you can get Nano's revolutionary technology just $347. Don't be fooled by higher priced hearing aids. The CIC Recharge is a true hearing aid, not an amplifier. With rechargeable technology many customers say is superior to more expensive models. Call now and get not one, but two Nano hearing aids for just $347. Plus, we'll add a portable charging dock and ship your order absolutely free. The CIC Recharge has a tiny in-the-ear canal design that is nearly invisible. Why keep missing out on important conversations or waste thousands of dollars? Call and get two CIC Recharge hearing aids for only $347 and free shipping. Call now. 800-817-7419. Again, that's 800-817-7419. Imagine, this is your money and someone wants to take it from you. Who is it? The IRS. Guess what? They want your money and they can take it, all of it if they want. Remember, they sent you that letter right over here that said, hey, you owe us a bunch of cash and we're gonna take it from you right now. So what do you do? You fight back by letting our team of experts work it out with the IRS so you can keep your money. And hey, we're good at what we do. When you hire us, you get a team of guys on your side that know the IRS laws and we'll fight really hard to save your money. So, if you owe the IRS a ton of cash and you wanna keep it, call right now and learn for free how we can help you put it back in your pocket. Five minutes of your time right now can save you thousands of dollars. And the best part, it's a free call. So please call right now. I've written a new book. It's called The Courage to Change Everything, Daily Strategies and Wisdom to Unlock Your Genius, Your Soul, and to Transform Your Life. So it's daily strategies. I wrote this specifically because over the years I've noticed in my own life and in the lives of my clients that, listen, a little inspiration doesn't get it. A little wisdom doesn't get it. A little action doesn't get it. It's daily, dripping on the mind, dripping on those actions, taking specific focused actions towards your dreams and 
setting specific goals, right? Goals help us to transform the little self into the possibilities that we have in each of us. All of us are given dreams, and if you're sitting there and you're not manifesting that dream, it's just a little bit of you is chipping away every day that's not happening until you finally wake up and say, I don't know how I'm going to do this, but I'm going to connect with something greater than myself, my force, my God, my life, my universe, whatever. I don't care what you call it. You tune into that force, and that's what's going to get you to the next level. Well, welcome back, everybody. This is your host, Kennedy Foster, and we're talking to wellness expert in the workplace, uh, Laura Putnam. And uh, we're going to get to her book uh, very shortly, but I have one more question for you around the uh, the brain, the mind, the mindset of wellness. What is the mindset of wellness, Laura? Yeah, I mean, I think that's really a great question that, you know, how do we, uh, you know, construct the right mindset so that we're more likely to succeed. And one thing that we can do that's also in my book, uh, Workplace Wellness That Works, so it works for organizations, it works for teams, and, and it works for individuals, is this idea of starting with what's right. That is starting from a more positive place. And I think so often when we set these goals, we focus on what we're doing wrong. And then we try to fix ourselves. And um, you'd think that fear would motivate us, but actually what the research suggests is just the opposite, that fear actually has a demotivating effect. Whereas when we begin from a more positive place, we're more likely to succeed. So let me break this down for you a little bit. You would think, for example, that a heart attack would be enough to scare someone into making a change. And what typically happens is that, let's say that a post-cardiac patient comes out from surgery, their well-meaning cardiologist says, okay, look, you've had this surgery, this double bypass surgery, for example. Now you need to make sure that you make some changes in your lifestyle, start eating healthier, get enough exercise, so that you don't have another occurrence. And, um, and if you don't make these changes, then you will die. Um, that's the typical kind of messaging. Now, you would think that this would be enough to, quote, scare someone into making a change. But what the research suggests is that actually only 10% of post-cardiac patients, they abide by these kind of fear-based uh, guidelines uh, to make lifestyle change. So Dean Ornish, who is a leading uh, cardiologist who's really used a, a healthy lifestyle approach to helping post-cardiac patients, they've used a different approach whereby they encourage post-cardiac patients to instead, rather than fear death, to embrace life. And after three years, they have almost an 80% adherence rate uh, with these prescribed lifestyle changes, like changes in diet, changes in exercise. And this really goes to show the power of applying a more positive approach. How might I start with what's right? How do I bring less of a fear-based approach to this and more of a positive approach to this? I really like that a lot, and uh, I've read a lot about uh, read a lot of Dean Ornish's books over the years, and it, he's definitely in the cutting edge here. Of uh, well, he's <laughs> he's been cutting edge for a couple decades now, so he's um, he's really uh, helped a lot of people. I I'm wondering, you know, we're, there's this, uh, this saying, you know, you're you're uh, I think it's you're not your brother's keeper. Or are we our brother's keeper? Either way, I want to throw this out. Um, you know, when I see somebody in my family that's suffering, what I want to do immediately is reach out and help them. And I and I sense that that is a not necessarily the mindset in a lot of organizations. That we are in a place of still a competitive environment where we're competing with one another. We're looking at how we can move ourselves up. And I think that old, that mindset is an old an old mindset that probably needs to go away because I think that we're talking about wellness in the workplace. What happens to the secretary happens to me, the boss. If she's out sick, it's impacting me. It's impacting everybody. If if I'm if I'm you know my tech people are down, it's impacting the company at some level. 
So I think when we start to take more of a holistic approach that we're all connected here, it seems like that might uh, further the conversations of wellness in the workplace. What, what's your hit on that? I, I think that you're spot on. And, and, you know, there's been so much around individual optimization, whether we're talking about how do I become the best possible worker I can be? How do I become a high performing uh, employee? But also, how can I make changes in my own life around my health and well being? And really, um, particularly when we're talking about the workplace, it's less about what the individual does well, and it's more about how do we work well together. So it's more about team optimization than it is about individual optimization. And so, for example, Google did some research around you know, what is the, the characteristic of the most high performing teams. And what they found was that it's less about the individuals who are in those teams. So like you might have a collection of super smart people um, that all went to the best schools. That's not going to matter as much as how they work together. And so in this study, they found that the number one predictor of a high performing team is one that had a high level of so-called psychological safety. And so a team that has a high level of psychological safety is one in which people feel like that they can take interpersonal risks. And it is one in which people really feel seen um, by one another. It's one in which people are really paying attention to the social cues and kind of what's happening beneath the surface. And it's also one in which there's relative air, uh, shared airtime. Uh, but it's these kinds of things where people are paying attention to not only what can I as an individual do to perform at better levels, but what can we do together to enhance our overall performance? That's what's going to matter the most at the end of the day. That makes a lot of sense. You know, one of the other key factors, of course, is uh, education, is uh, information and how we deliver that in the workplace. So I'd like to talk to you about that and your uh, new book when we get back from this next break. So. We will be right back. Attention cancer victims who used the weed killer Roundup. A federal jury unanimously found that Monsanto's popular weed killer Roundup was a substantial factor in causing cancer. You may be entitled to substantial compensation. If you or someone you love used Roundup weed killer and were diagnosed with non-Hodgkin lymphoma, call the number on your screen now. The World Health Organization has designated glyphosate, the main ingredient in Roundup weed killer, a probable human carcinogen. Thousands of agriculture workers may have been exposed to serious health risks by using this dangerous product. You may be owed significant financial compensation from the manufacturer. Call and speak to an experienced attorney today for a free consultation. If you don't win, you pay nothing. If you or someone you love used Roundup and were diagnosed with cancer, call the number on your screen now. Don't wait. There may be time deadlines to file a claim. Call 800-925-7921. That's 800-925-7921. Has social emotional learning become just one more thing on your teacher's plates? Do teachers and students both find it boring and ineffective? Then bring Kikori to your school. Kikori transforms classrooms through experiential SEL activities that help students play, reflect, connect, and grow. Even better, students say it's more fun than recess. Schedule a no-obligation conversation at kikoriapp.com slash bringkikori, K-I-K-O-R-I. If you're living with diabetes and using insulin, you know the pain of pricking your fingers over and over again. By wearing a small remote device called a continuous glucose monitor or CGM, you can reduce the pain of pricking your fingers right away. If you have type 1 or type 2 diabetes, administer insulin three or more times a day or use an insulin pump. Call the Diabetic Health Hotline today and learn about the latest CGM technology. Not only can a CGM immediately reduce pain, 
It is accurate, easy to use, and helps you make better diabetes treatment decisions. And if you have Medicare or private insurance, you can get a new CGM at little or no out-of-pocket cost. We will also provide free shipping of your new CGM and will bill your insurance company for you. If you have type 1 or type 2 diabetes, administer insulin three or more times a day or use an insulin pump. Call now and learn how to receive your new continuous glucose monitor at little to no out-of-pocket cost. Well, welcome back, everybody. Uh, we're talking to Laura Putnam. We're talking about well-being in the workplace. And before I get to Laura real quick, I want to just give a quick shout out to a couple of our new uh, networks that have brought us on. Uh, Pizzazz uh, TV, thank you so much. Uh, Flix TV, E360 TV, we appreciate all of you bringing us on. Also, we'd like to give a shout out to UK Health uh, Radio there in the UK. It's uh, great that we're part of your network also. And uh, the, the, I think there's 185 million new listeners that are coming in through that network. So uh, welcome all of you too to the Voices of Courage show. Laura, um, wow, okay, your book. Uh, your book is, uh, you know, is, is helping to inspire education in the workplace. What can we do uh, in the workplace to actually um, educate in, in greater ways? Well, you know, I, I'm a big fan of education. I'm a former urban public high school teacher, um, turned what I characterize as a movement builder in the world of health and well-being. Also a formerly competitive gymnast, a former professional dancer, um, all of this kind of combined to really look for meaningful ways to create transformational learning experiences within the workplace. And in particular, around this education piece, as you're talking about, it's important to, that we not only be educating kind of the broader employee base, what are things that I can do to improve my health and well-being uh, around multiple dimensions of well-being, not only physical well-being, but also things like emotional well-being, social well-being that we've talked about, uh, community well-being, financial well-being, career well-being. All of these different dimensions really go into our overall well-being. But also, what can those key influencers in the workplace be doing? And how do we provide meaningful learning experiences for those key influencers so that they can bring it to the workplace? And those key influencers, can are managers. Managers, whether or not well-being is part of your job description, the extent to which you are not only uh, practicing it yourself, but also intentionally bringing well-being to your team has everything to do with the extent to which your team members are also well. And so we've really focused a lot of our efforts at Motion Infusion around uh, giving, empowering managers through these leadership training programs, it's called Managers on the Move, around how they can become so-called multipliers of well-being for their team. And the keys are really around, you gotta do it yourself, lead by example, you gotta talk about it, which I call speak, and then finally you've gotta create some team-based systems that help to normalize well-being uh, within your team. Because again, uh, what, the, what longstanding research from Gallup shows is that the manager alone likely accounts for up to 70% of the variance of their team members' engagement, both with their work as well as their well-being. So given that uh, outsized influence that every manager has on their team members, it's really important that they be armed with really good education, as you talked about, around how leadership and well-being go hand in hand. Mm, that's good. Yeah, I, I think all well-being starts with a uh, safe place that we can... Um, we we feel safe in our environment. We feel safe with our employees. We feel safe connecting with one another. It just seems like it starts there. And I guess that does start with a manager. It starts with leadership to create safe environments where people feel that they uh, can speak their uh, their truth, what's going on for them. You know, it's interesting with the, uh, um, you know, with well-being because it covers such a vast area. You know, in my, in my world, it's mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual. I don't know if we ever get in the spiritual and the corporate place because you know, can't talk about that so much. But um, but there is the uh, the emotional piece here, and 
it seems like a lot of the research coming out is that, uh, you know, if you're carrying past emotional traumas and dramas and upsets and stuff, that it's actually, uh, it's actually in the cells. It's in the, in the body cells is what we're finding. Um, how, how do you, how do you manage something like that in the, in the workplace? I mean, you know, yeah, I guess you got psychologists and psychiatrists and stuff like that in the workplace to help with that, but how, how, how is that being managed today? The emotional challenges that people it, have. It, it's such a great question, Ken. And, 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 you know, one of the things we might call the second act of the pandemic is the toll on our mental health. And we really all collectively have experienced an enormous amount of trauma. Uh, as related to that. And, and in addition, you know, a lot of those measures that we needed to take during the pandemic to protect our mental health, things like masking up, things like social distancing, also took a real toll on our mental health. Uh, you know, one of the best ways that we can protect ourselves on an emotional level is by connecting with others. And we were having to disconnect from others. And so, uh, what the research suggests is that we were all overwhelmingly affected on a, on a deep emotional mental level. So, for example, one study came out showing that rates of depression tripled for Americans uh, in, in the wake of the pandemic. So that leads us to, to your question, Ken, which is how do we tackle this taboo topic? of mental health in the workplace. So it's not only depression, it's anxiety, it's things like rising rates of burnout, and it's even things uh, like suicide. And um, it, one of the things that, that's really important for all of your listeners to know is that while the pandemic certainly accelerated and these uh, mental health issues that we're seeing, all of the seeds were planted long before. So for example, a CDC study found that rates of, of suicide actually increased by 30% between the years of 2000 and 2016. So this is an issue, has, has actually been a longstanding issue, but now one that, that organizations can no longer ignore. So what do we do about it? Well, the first is that we have to begin uncovering root causes. And so when we look at something, for example, like burnout, what the research suggests is that, in fact, burnout often has less to do with the individual and how resilient they are or even how much individual you know, trauma they may uh, be bringing uh, and more to do with the workplace itself. So the top drivers of burnout uh, employee burnout are things like work overload or things like toxicity tolerated in the workplace or things like lack of connection between manager and their team members. And so those are the kinds of things that uh, organizations actually need to be taking more of an outside in look at how do we create an environment in which people feel more supported, more cared for, uh, because of where they work, because of the team that they're on. And, and so organizations and team leaders need to be thinking more proactively around these mental health issues. So instead of just how do we provide the resources for the individuals, how do we, I quote, identify the individuals who are at risk and connect them with those resources like employee assistance programs, the question really becomes more around how do we create an environment here, a culture here, in which people feel more cared for uh, and, and they're less likely to become anxious and depressed in the first place. Um, yeah. So, uh, and in fact, they, they're, they're supported more on a, on a mental, emotional level. Well, I, I'm so, I'm really happy to hear that. You know, I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm, I'm not in the workplace per se. I mean, uh, I'm an entrepreneur and, you know, I work with a lot of people in the, in that are working in the workplace. And I have to tell you that, you know, I've been coaching for 26 years, you know, as a business strategist and as a life coach. And when people come to me, the first thing I start to ask them is, what are you tolerating? OK, what are you tolerating in the workplace? What are you tolerating in your own life? What are you tolerating about yourself? What, you know, I want to look at your tolerations because um, it's from that place that, you know, people know they have their own answers. They know. And a lot of times it's happened, you know, is when I start asking those questions and they're in a, they're in a toxic environment, doesn't matter who they are, they're in a toxic environment, they start to realize that 
this is on them. They're tolerating this and they start looking. They start looking for something different. So it does go back to the managers out there and the corporations to wake up and like, hey, listen, if you don't want this kind of turnover, you got to do something. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Know, environments. <laughs> right. And, you know, long standing research from Gallup shows that, uh, that those employees who are thriving at work, they mm -hmm. are, guess what, 81% less likely to leave. So mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of managers feel like, you know, especially with something like this taboo topic of mental health, this is out of my hands. Uh, you know, this, uh, you know, that's up to the experts. I'm not a therapist. And of course, most managers, they're not therapists and we're not asking them to be therapists. But what, we, what we are asking them to do is to take measures like appreciating their team members, not only for what they do, but for who they are as human beings. So that means carving out time to really uh, connect with their team members on a human to human level, not just connecting with them on a, on a work level, while that is important as well. Uh, so these, these small kinds of shifts uh, in no, attitude can make a huge difference. Yeah, those are big shifts. You know, I, um, I have a client that uh, I worked on with that in that exact issue. He really wanted to connect more with his, uh, his employees. He had to learn how to connect with himself more before he could connect with his team more. So even though it's on the surface, it's like, oh, yeah, I can go out and, and you know, and appreciate who they are and give gratitude for that. You got to learn. You got to you got to learn how to be it yourself. <laughs> before I, you, I, I call you this. Want I want to. Security. Right. Totally. <laughs> I, I, I uh, talk about the phenomenon that people want to see their boss in spandex. Uh, or maybe not. But the idea I, is that, you know, they really want to see their boss in there doing it with them, making the effort to engage with their health and well-being in every dimension, not, not only on a physical level, but also on an um, emotional and mental well-being level. And so now is the time for, for every manager, every leader to really step up to meet the moment by showing some vulnerability. Uh, especially around mental and emotional well-being. And it, it, to your point, it really does start with them, with them role modeling. And this is why in our Managers on the Move leadership training program, we start first and foremost with you got to do it. You got to do. You got to lead by example. Um, you are the key permission giver within the workplace, uh, particularly for your team. And the moment that they see you doing it, when you engage in your own personal self-care, that is, in fact, one of the most giving things for your team members because you are giving them permission to also engage with their self-care. And nothing like uh, engaging in your self-care and sharing that with a group that will help you, the manager, to actually accomplish that self-care. Right. So it's a virtuous, uh, it's a feedback loop, isn't it's it? A feedback <laughs> loop. It's like you go tell your team, hey, listen, I've decided to... Uh, uh, to learn how to meditate. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I've committed to 10 minutes a day every day. And, uh, you know, you, you have accountability now because they're going to ask you, well, how, how's that going? And a lot of them are going to be curious. Well, oh, you're slowing down. You're slowing down to succeed. You seem to be more productive. Yeah, I've, I've learned how to <clears throat> let go of some of the unimportant things and be able to really tune into my own well-being. And all of a sudden things are showing up better for me. I, be, I am more productive because I have more energy. All right, listen, I got to take a quick break. We'll be right back. I'm going to uh, definitely, we're going to talk about the book. I want to take a deep dive into that when we get back. We'll be right back. Are you over 50? Would you like to get up to 33% more income in retirement? Then call now for this free book, Annuity Do's and Don'ts for Baby Boomers. This free book reveals little-known secrets about annuity strategies that will help you make the right choices before buying an annuity. Call right now for your free book. And as a bonus, we'll also throw in a free annuity rate report, both absolutely free, for calling Annuity General today. Call 800-510-0470. Are you feeling stuck or in a holding pattern with your business or life, and you're not doing the things you want or love? Then at some point, you're going to be faced with a decision. You'll either choose to keep living in your comfort zone and risk a life of mediocrity or increase your courage, step into your power and forge into the unknown where everything new becomes possible. If you're truly ready to live masterfully, then you need Ken D. Foster's newest book, 
the courage to change everything, strategies and wisdom to transform your life one day at a time. This powerful but simple guide provides you with 365 days of life-transforming wisdom, profound questions, and action steps that will increase your strength and open the doors to success. Stop wondering why your business or life isn't working. The answers are available now. Imagine if you had more courage or another chance to start following your dreams. To pick up your copy of The Courage to Change Everything, visit The Courage to Change everything.com that's the courage to change everything.com well welcome back everybody this is your host kennedy foster and we're talking about uh, wellness in the workplace with wellness expert laura putnam laura has a new book out i want to uh, put that on screen for everybody it's called uh, workplace wellness uh, that works and uh, we've been talking uh, a lot of the principles today about the book. But I want to ask you, Laura, what, what inspired you to write this book? Oh, well, I think what inspired me is just, you know, seeing all this, how workplace wellness had been getting a bad rap and, you know, workplace wellness, it doesn't work. And, and actually, there's a real opportunity here uh, that most adults are spending their waking hours at work, whether it's in person or virtually. And so why not leverage every workplace to promote better health and well-being, especially if we consider the trajectory that we are on as Americans, but also around the world where lifestyle driven poor health and well-being is on the increase, not the decrease. So even though wellness is the fastest growing industry, our health and well-being, even our life expectancy is going in reverse. And this is pandemic aside. And so... Uh, how do we more meaningfully leverage every workplace? Um, this is what I call school for adults. So just like uh, every school has the opportunity to be a real point of transformation for our young people, um, the same is true for every workplace. Uh, you know, getting back to what you were talking about, the power of education, we can really leverage every workplace as a, as a learning place for people to learn better how to support their health and well-being. And so this book really provides a, a better strategy for organizations to use in order to better promote well-being in the workplace. I love that, Laura. I'm glad you wrote that book. And, you know, it, it's interesting to me. All companies, every company I've ever that's successful is always asking themselves how they can get better, how they can develop, they can grow, they can improve, they can better their product, their customer service. Why don't we ask that for ourselves? <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, you know, we're in environments that do that, but, but a lot of times, you know, uh, it, the uh, employees of the organization is really not taking responsibility for that. But I think a lot of that has to do with education. And that's why I'm glad you wrote that book. Let me ask you about uh, the benefits. When somebody's reading this book, what are they going to walk away from? What, what well, one of, yeah, I mean, one of the benefits is, is just understanding, first and foremost, why are we even talking about this? What does well-being have to do with not only optimizing ourselves as individuals, but what does it have to do with the bottom line? What does it have to do with building a high-performing team? So what the research overwhelmingly suggests is that well-being at work is not only good for people, but it is essential for meeting any key metric. So whether you're talking about productivity or you're talking about absenteeism or you're talking about healthcare costs or you're talking about uh, retention and attraction, you're talking about safety, profitability, you give me any metric that matters and I will show you how it ties to well-being. So for example, three studies in a row found that those companies that are investing in comprehensive well-being programs that actually work, they actually perform better on the stock market compared to companies that aren't making that investment. So beyond the why, then it becomes, well, how do we go about doing this uh, so that we actually help people to become their healthier, happier selves uh, so that they can become their version of me at my best. And what I have found is that people respond more to being part of a movement than they respond to being part of a program. So the task at hand is for every organization to think about how can we not only start a movement, but how can we build it and then how can we make it last? And so these 10 steps really outline a roadmap 
for every organization and the leaders within those organizations to start, build, and sustain a movement of well-being. You know, sometimes organizations have uh, pretty strong cultures in place. And that culture can be a culture that uh, leads to uh, disease, dis-ease in the workplace. How do you overcome or, you know, is that in the book where you can start to uh, help people to unravel their corporate culture and set a new culture in, space, in, in, uh, in place so that we can promote wellness? I'm so glad you asked that question. So step three in the book is actually called Uncover the Hidden Factors which is to really take a deep dive into your company culture, not the culture that it pretends to be, <laughs> but what the real culture is and uh, to really start to assess that and to start to look at, is there a disconnect between the programs that we offer around well-being, between the messaging that we have and our deeper company culture? So for example, maybe you have some programs that are encouraging, quote, educating employees around the importance of turning off their devices at night. Well, if you have a company culture in which people feel like that they always have to be on and in which your direct supervisor is sending you late night emails, chances are you'll be doing the same. You're not going to listen to that messaging in the standalone wellness program around turning off your device at night. Instead, you follow the lead of the larger culture. So that's why it's so important that first and foremost, that we start to just make that more visible. Like what's actually happening in the culture? Is this a culture in which people are healthier because they work there? Or is it just the opposite? And if so, we need to really start to look at that. Um, you know, one of the examples that I use is in one week, one naval ship, had three suicides. Now, this happened in September of 2019. This then happened again on another naval ship in April of 2022. And so, uh, and this felt, uh, this came on the heels of the Navy having invested heavily in suicide prevention and in mental health overall. And a, a question that needs to be asked, though, is, is the environment itself driving people to become suicidal. And so what I often ask companies and their leaders to consider is, is our company and is my team a naval ship in the making in which the environment and the culture itself is driving not only poor health and well-being, but also poor mental well-being and, uh, and, and really exacerbating some of these emotional issues. That's really good. And, you know, you said one thing there. Um, and by the way, we're just about, oh, we've got a minute and a half to go. But you did say that uh, uh, we're, I think organization, organizations should strive to have uh, their organization be a place where you get healthier every day instead of sicker every day. Anyway, I've got to leave it with that. Uh, Laura, thank you so much for being here. This is so informative. I, I believe the audience really has been inspired and informed. I hope everybody you go to uh, Amazon or go to, uh, uh, yeah, go to uh, Amazon and, or just Google Workplace Wellness That Works by Laura Putnam and get that book. It sounds like a fascinating read. And uh, again, thank you for being here. Thanks so much for having me, Ken. It was great to be with you. Alrighty. For all of you, I want to thank you for being here and listening to Voices of Courage. Uh, if you have a colleague right now that might benefit from this, maybe your manager, maybe your boss, maybe your CEO, I encourage you to uh, uh, let them know about this show. And you can share it with them on uh, Google or Facebook or Twitter. Uh, we're on all those platforms. Or you can go to Voices of Courage dot us voices of courage dot us to get all of our replays you can also tell cortana siri or alexa just play voices of courage podcast and it will come right up for you so until next time i uh, pray that you will continue to look for and see the unseeable and know the unknowable and then do the impossible in your own life mm -hmm.